this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We talked the last time about what's on your screen right now. The seed, all of these nice little bundles of joy. We plant them in the ground. They go from one person to another. And basically, they are just tiny little capsules, bundles of deoxyribonucleic acid, or in biblical terms, the Word of God. Luke 8, 11. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. Notice the Bible. Notice DNA. Matthew chapter 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. We noted in the last one that you have in Psalm 139, verse 16, David said, In thy book all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So we understand now what people beyond 75 years ago could, could never really understand is just how right this Bible is when it compares seed to the Word of God, or even seed being compared to a book, because that is exactly what DNA is. It is a book. It's a book of prophecy, because the moment that the seed goes into the ground, or the moment that a woman receives seed, at that moment, the child is conceived and everything that is going to grow out of that child into a human being, everything about that is already written down in a very well-structured, very well-organized book. In the Bible, we still, we call that seed. So the, compar the, the Bible comparison of seed to a book or seed to the Word of God in it of itself is absolutely amazing. It shows you the accuracy of the Word of God in a day when people had no understanding whatsoever of the process of how a child is conceived in the womb or what happens or what's contained inside these little capsules that we plant into the ground we now know that that outer shell breaks down it corrupts and what's on the inside is bundles of dna which will make everything that is encoded in that seed or in that dna we ended up last time comparing the idea of the seed with the Word of God and what exactly the Bible says the Word of God is. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, here's where it is. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. We know from our last series that these verses here, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, 66 words exactly. 66 books here. John, and then John 1, 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, Revelation 19, 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So when we look at these seeds again, we understand what they really represent. They represent both Jesus and they represent the Bible being the Word of God. Again, Luke 8, 11. Now the parable is this, the seed is the Word of God. So, let's do a quick rundown here, because then now we're going to get serious with it. We know that seed, in any kind of seed, is a bundle of DNA. DNA is a book that God, very important, because we're living in an age. Let me finish the statement. That book is a book that God wrote 
in every form of life on this earth, it starts out, and I guess in the heavens too, according to 1 Corinthians 15, but every form of life starts out with seed, the bundles of DNA that make the body. We learned from, boy, it almost turned, look there, it turned right to it, 1 Corinthians 15, and um, the Bible talks about the resurrection, and it says, um, verse 38, But God giveth the body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. So any form of life has as its beginning seed that dictates or spells out exactly what that body is going to be. And 1 Corinthians 15, 40, there are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Two different types, and yet terrestrial bodies and celestial beings, we know from the scripture, have bodies. And now we know that if it has a body, seed is what made that body made its appearance, made its members, made everything about it. All the functions of my body are written in my DNA or written in the seed of my DNA. So when, it, when, we're, when we're understanding what this seed is, we know that it is, number one, DNA. Number two, the word seed, if you read it in the Bible, you'll see that it you know, has a reference to offspring, the child, the, the fruit, as it were. When we plant seeds in our garden or a farmer planting seeds out in his field, he has hope that, th that a stalk will rise up of some kind or a vine or whatever it is, and that the fruit of that vine or the fruit of that stalk is going to be his, it's going to be his income, it's going to be his sustenance, it's going to be his bread or whatever it is. But he has hope that that seed will produce something far greater. You put one seed in the ground, let's say you're planting corn, you plant one corn kernel in the ground, but you have hope that that stalk is going to produce, I don't know, three or four or five different ears of corn, and each one of those ears has a bunch of seeds on it. So seed is also about increase or getting the fruit of our doings. You know, we have this expression, well, you reap what you sow. That comes from the Bible. And as we do this study, we're going to see what all that entails. But anyway, getting back to what seed is. Seed is a book of DNA, a bundle of DNA. Seed refers to offspring. Seed refers to the Word of God. And so anyone who goes forth bearing precious seed, like the Word of God, we have hope. I have hope. When I make any of these videos, or I preach a sermon, or I teach a lesson, or I do Pastor Mike online, anything that it is that I do, I have hope that the seed of the Word of God, not my words, but the Word of God, goes into your heart, into your mind, into your hearing, and I'm planting the Word of God in you in hopes that for your life and for the kingdom of God's sake, because I don't own the field, I'm just the servant to the master who does. But my hope is the same as the master's hope, is that when the seed is planted in your life or your life or your life or anybody's life, that it will produce the fruits of righteousness and holiness and belief, the fruit of faith, the fruit of joy. In fact, let me do this. Here's, here's what I hope, what I do does for your life. My hope is that the fruit of the Spirit will be manifested in your life, love. I want you to love people. I want you to love sinners the way Jesus loves them, give himself for them. I want you to love the Word of God. I want you to love righteousness. I, I would like for you to love me because I love you. Love, joy. I would that you had joy in your life. To me, it is a joy to sit here and do what I do. I love it. 
and it brings me great joy to do this. And that's because of what God has sown in me manifested and multiplied. And I want to give back to you peace. I want you to have peace with God, peace with others, peace in your own mind and heart, long suffering, the ability to put up with people the way God has put up with you. Um, long suffering, meaning that you got to sit through two hours of PMO or whatever. All right. Gentleness. Oh, I would that God would sow into us the seed and bring forth the fruit of gentleness. So we're not mean people, rough people, arrogant people, uh, goodness, faith. Oh, that's it right there. See what in everything that I do, I want you to believe more than you ever did what this book says. That's where my joy comes from. When people call, when people write, when people send me letters or emails or whatever and say, Pastor, because of your Watchman broadcast or your Pastor Mike online or your, because of what God has you do, we now believe the Word of God. We believe the King James. We, we tossed all of our old translations. We got rid of our old stupid purpose-driven books, and we got rid of our Hebrew roots books, and we got rid of our books on witchcraft. We got, we got rid of everything, and now we are into the pure Word of God. That's where I get my joy from. When people call, when people write, and I get these emails, sometimes I will cry, I'll bawl. I'll weep before the Lord in joy that what God did to me some 20 some odd years ago, it was bad. What God did to me was an effort to manifest the fruit of the spirit in my life so that it could be manifested in others lives. That's where I get my joy from is your faith, meekness, temperance against such. There is no law. And so my hope is and that in me planting the seed of the word of God, that these fruits of the spirit would be manifested in your life and they would conquer the previous verses in Galatians five. Uh, if you be led by the spirit, verse 18, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. There's 18 things here. That's a, you can see it as like a multiple of nine. Nine times two is 18. So you have the nine fruits of the spirit here. Nine is the number for fruit bearing. Genesis nine. God said, be fruitful and multiply. Okay. That, I think that phrase be fruitful is like nine times in the Bible. Galatians, ninth book of the New Testament. You can't make this stuff up, people. And there's nine fruits of the Spirit. But there's 18 works of the flesh. You can see this nine times two, six plus six plus six. Get it? So my hope is that the seed being planted in your life manifests the fruit of the Spirit that overcomes idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, so on and so on and so on. See, love will conquer hate every single time. So that's, that's my joy, is that the fruit manifested in your life because of the seed of the Word of God planted in your life. So the seed is the Word of God. The seed is our Bible. The seed is an offspring. And the seed is Jesus Christ. But... As we're going to see, there are two types of seed. Let me read while I'm just kind of going freestyle here, going off my notes. Uh, for, I don't need to turn to it. First Peter chapter one, verse 23, uh, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. There's two types of seed in the Bible. There is incorruptible seed, there's corruptible seed. And what we know is incorruptible seed only produces incorruptible fruit. Corruptible seed only produces corrupt, corrupt fruit, corruptible fruit. However, that's 
all that it does. Apple seeds make apples, orange seeds make orange, banana seeds, yes, there are banana seeds, banana seeds make bananas, mustard seeds make mustard trees, and that's it. Apple seeds do not produce thorns. Thorn, the acacia tree, or shittim, that's what it's called in the Bible, that tree starts out with a seed, and that seed only produces and bears thorns. You cannot plant corruptible seed that is intended to bear thorns and think that it's going to produce apples. It will not do it. And so let's take a look at it. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put in and think now, think and keep in mind what, um, what we know now seed is. It is a bundle of DNA. It is the word of God. Or we're going to find out it's someone else's words. It's either incorruptible seed or corruptible seed. And according to Genesis 3, there is an enmity between the seeds. There is a warfare going on of incorruptible seed versus corruptible seed. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Notice what I have written here. This is Christ versus Antichrist. The body of believers versus the children of disobedience. Because remember, seed refers to offspring as well. Uh, the sons of God versus the children of Belial. Jesus' words versus Satan's words. Remember, Genesis 3, it all boils down to here's what God said in Genesis 2, and then here's what Satan said in Genesis 3. And there is enmity. I have these books that just, I won't say magically appeared. They just showed up. I went and got them, okay? So, and, and I used to do this a lot. I used to keep a bunch of books here on the desk. And I'm going to do that for this series. Here is the pure, incorruptible seed of the Word of God. This is what went into my life as a young boy that convinced me that I was a sinner. This is what was preached into me all the days growing up. This is what I read out of when I was in Bible college. This is the book that I started to walk away from early in life. In my early ministry years, I was giving out NIV Bibles to people, okay? And then God brought me back to this book, and I'm convinced that it's right in everything that it says. And what this book has done in my life, I mean, it saved me, it cleansed me, it made me a, a, a better husband, a better man, a better Christian, a better minister, it, it has made me better than I ever was before. And I owe my life and I dedicate my life to the service of this book. It, 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 will, it will make you free is what this book will do. This is incorruptible seed. This is Christ, the word of God. Here is corruptible seed. This is, this was my first Greek New Testament. And when I took Greek class, I, I cheated because it's an interlinear Greek. It doesn't just have the Greek. It's got the literal translation underneath it. And then it's got the New American Standard Bible over here. That's corrupt seed. Here's the Aramaic English New Testament where they took, they didn't like how the New Testament was written. The King James, because it didn't prove their Hebrew roots. You got to go back and keep the Torah nonsense. So they retranslated it. They, they said that the original New Testament was written in Hebrew or Aramaic. And since no copies anywhere were found of original documents or early copies of the New Testament in Hebrew or Aramaic, what they decided to do was go and translate the New Testament back into Aramaic. So they can say, see, this is the original. This is how it would have originally looked. That's corrupt. We have the Green Bible. Understand the Bible's powerful message for the earth, forward by Desmond Tutu, 
the new revised standard version. Here we have Eugene Peterson's The Mess Edge Bible. This, this Bible is so new age. It's, here we have the new Oxford Annotated Bible with the Apocrypha, the Ecumenical Study Bible. Um, what the new, yeah, this is the new revised standard version. This has the Apocrypha in it. And then, dun dun dun, Morals and Dogman. Dog, dogma, morals and dogma. This is all, and I could go and get books and books and books and books on just about every subject in the world because I've either collected them or people have given them to me and said, Pastor, if you can use this, fine, but we don't want to touch it anymore. Touch not the unclean thing. So people have given me books. This is all corrupt seed. And what these books say is not the same thing as what this book says. What these books all say is, yea, hath God said. What, what these books will say is, ye shall not surely die. Okay? But you can have your eyes open. That's what these books say. This book is different. And there is an enmity between this seed and this seed over here. Let's look at it in parable form. Matthew chapter 13. Verse 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. That would be the Bible, the word of God. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Look at verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So we have this, and I love Matthew 13 is full of seed parables. Um, I haven't, use this one yet, but probably at some point in this study, we're going to go to the parable of the seed and the sower, where the sort, where the seed falls on good ground or stony ground or wayside or th among thorns or whatever. And we'll use that in comparison. But Matthew 13 is an amazing chapter. And in this one here, he's telling you the history of the whole world in one parable. We have God sowing good seed. Now we know that God on day three of creation planted all the seed bearing trees. We talked about that in this previous episode. Uh, we also know that, uh, let's say on day four, he planted all the celestial bodies, right? First Corinthians 15. Then on day five, he planted all the fish in the sea and the fowl of the air. They have DNA. Then on day six, it's all the beasts of the earth and man. And every one of them has DNA. Every one of them has the DNA that God made for them. Amen? So that's the good seed the stuff that God himself wrote, the stuff that God made, the stuff that God spoke with his word into existence and gave them all their own unique seed or their own unique DNA. But then man comes along. Man looks at it and says, well, I don't like this particular corn brand. It doesn't grow enough for me. So Monsanto comes along, yep genetically modified seed and they rewrite it. What they've done is that they have taken incorruptible seed, what God wrote, and they corrupted it by putting man's own sentences in it or man's 
whatever man wants to change it into, that's what man is now knowing how to do. And he's doing it on an ever increasing scale. Well, let's go back to the simplicity of it. We know that God also in Genesis two gave Adam his instructions on, he gave Adam one law. He said, Genesis two, you know, of every tree, um, Let's see here. Yep, yeah, here it is. Verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Do you know there's 39 words here? There's 39 books in the law. This is the law. This is the proto-law. It's like a type, a foreshadowing of the whole Old Testament, whereby God says, If you eat of this fruit, then you'll die. God gave a commandment to abstain from eating this one fruit. He could have had everything in the garden, and he did. He had everything freely given to him. He didn't have to work. And all he had was this one lousy tree that he couldn't eat of. And Adam's going, well, that's simple enough. One rule, surely I'm not going to break that. 39 words here. It's a picture of the Old Testament, picture of the law. What, and that's, and that's, there's glory in it. Paul said there's glory in the law. Moses comes down with the law in his hand. What, his face is shining like the sun. This shining so bright they can't even see it. Okay? So, Satan comes along, Genesis 3, and says, Yea, hath God said. Questions the authenticity of God's word. Then he supposedly corrects God's word. You shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, then you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. There's your tares right there. And God, in his wisdom, and again, Matthew 13, this parable is the whole history of the world. God planting the good seed, the devil coming in, sowing tares among the wheat. God saying to the servants, no, we're not going to gather them up now. We're going to let them both grow. And in the time of harvest, you see, because wheat and tares, when it's growing, you can't hardly tell the difference between them. So, but at harvest, and we're going to talk about that, at harvest, harvest is a transformation. The tares turn one way, the wheat turns another way, and now you can tell the difference. What God is, all of this junk that's out in the world, People have, you know, questioned, God, why are you allowing all these false prophets to speak their lies? Why do you allow the Catholic Church to say what they say? Why do you allow the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness and the Hebrew Roots and the Seventh-day Adventists and all these people out there spreading lies with other Gospels? God, why are you allowing that to happen? Be and the answer is, God is saying, I'm going to let them both grow. And when they manifest their fruit, you'll know them. You shall know them by their fruits. You see, I don't, I don't doubt what I'm saying to you about this Bible. And you may not accept it. You may not agree with me. You may not believe it. But I'm telling you that when fruit of this book is manifested and the fruit of, let's say, this book is manifested, it's different fruit. This book does not produce the same fruit that this book does. It doesn't do it. It's two different seeds, two different fruits. Okay? So in the time of harvest, it'll be known who is and who isn't. So let's look at Matthew 13, Jesus' explanation of this parable. Verse 36, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That's Jesus. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. In other words, everybody that's saved, born again. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Let me stop right here. We go back to Genesis 3, and I don't remember if I brought this out in the first episode of this, and I know I missed it here, but I'm going to declare it now. 
as literal as the concept is of the seed of the woman. You see, all the Bible scholars say, well, that obviously is Jesus. The seed of the woman is Jesus. Yep, sure is. And it's literal, isn't it? He was literally born of woman. But they'll say, now, the seed of the serpent, that's a metaphor for bad people, right? Or a metaphor for this, but it's not literal. Remember what seed represents. Seed represents a bundle of DNA. Seed represents a book of some kind, incorrupt or corrupt. Seed represents an offspring. In fact, the majority of times that the word seed or seed is mentioned in the Word of God, it's in reference to offspring. So, they say the seed of the woman is literal, and that is Christ, but the seed of the serpent is not literal. That's not true. Because back here, when Jesus is giving the explanation of it, he said the tares are the children of the wicked one. Literally, his words, and in Genesis 3, there's 46 of them exactly. And that's the number of chromosomes where our DNA is stored. So he was targeting seed, the seed of man, the seed of the woman. He was planting tares among the wheat. And God says in his wisdom, we're going to let both of them grow together. And in this world right now, there are two and only two types of people, saved and lost, period, the end. There's not a third group. Well, they're kind of saved. They're half saved and half lost. No, the DNA is specific. DNA can only produce a certain kind of offspring or fruit, and it's either incorruptible or corruptible. There's no halfway. And so, as we are literally the children of the kingdom, because of the seed of the word of God, everybody else also is a child of the devil in literal fashion because of his words, and they are part of it. And we are going to see the fruition of what, here's, think about this. The devil planted a seed, and he did it 6,000 years ago. And he has been waiting now 6,000 years for that tree or that vine or whatever it was he planted. He's been waiting all these years for that to manifest. Okay? And it's going to. The words that Satan said, ye shall be as gods knowing good and your eyes shall be open. Ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil and ye shall not surely die. That's going to happen. In Gen uh, Revelation 9, the sounding of the fifth trumpet, for five months, nobody on the earth dies. That's impossible. People are dying right now, right now, right now. All over the world, people are dying. But for five months, man becomes immortal. Nobody, he wants to die, but he doesn't. So in a limited fashion, the words that Satan spoke 6,000 years ago, that seed planted is, is springing forth and going to produce fruit in the last days. And it's going to be manifested. See, right now, you walk down the street, you'll see hundreds, maybe thousands of people. You don't know who's saved and who isn't by looking at them. Maybe by talking to them, getting to know them, maybe then you figure it out, but not now. So, the angel's coming, just picking people up random. Are you saved? Are you saved? No. But there's coming a time when everybody's going to be changed at harvest. Okay, so let's get back to this. Verse 38 again, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. And there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus, 
as he does doing a very outstanding job of explaining this parable. And it means exactly what Jesus said it means. There are children of the kingdom who have been born again of incorruptible seed. There are children of the wicked one. And as part of this study, we're going to, we're going to look at good seed today. The next time we're going to look at wicked seed. You study, I'll give you a word, the word Belial. You study that all through, you'll find children of Belial, sons of Belial. Belial is Satan. What concord hath Christ with Belial? And that was Satan trying to get Jesus into a concord with him. You know, do what I say and, you know, all this stuff. Jesus wouldn't have it. There is no concord between Christ and Satan. So Belial is Satan, and there are children of Belial, sons of Belial, daughters of Belial. And we're going to understand from the Word of God what that means. But let's get into the good seed. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not good because I'm naturally good. Not true. There is, abiding in my flesh, no good thing. My flesh is as wicked as anybody else's is. Okay? What is it then that makes me good? It's the seed. It's the Word of God doing in me what I cannot do for myself. Let's look at it from Scripture. Genesis 15, 5. He brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. If we... Ah, stop right here. It may take us a while. If we go back to 1 Corinthians 15... We know that there are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. The glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Right now, we are a terrestrial body. And the seed that produced this body was my father and my mother, both contributing 23 pairs of chromosomes, both contributing their strengths and their weaknesses. I have, abiding in me, the strengths of my mother and father and the weaknesses of my mother and father. And they, they are manifest every now and then. Same with you, right? So our hope is that one of these days, because of this seed, this seed did not come from the earth anywhere. This seed is from heaven. Because of this seed, my body will be changed from a vile body to like the stars of heaven. Okay? He said, tell the stars, so shall thy seed be. Genesis 17, 7, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generation. See that word generation? That's genetics. For an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So the good seed have God as their God. And they'll be like the stars in heaven. Psalm 1850, great deliverance giveth he to his king and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. So the seed, the good seed, have mercy. Psalm 89, 4, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. So four things we've seen so far. Number one. The seed that goes in us is going to manifest a body like the stars of heaven. Number two, God said that because of this seed, God is our God and we are his people. We're his children. To us, because of this seed, God gives us mercy. To us, because of this seed, he establishes it forever and throughout all generations. So, how can, if, as all these scholars say, if this Bible has corruptions in it, how then can a corrupt book produce incorrupt, an incorrupt body? It can, according to the rules that Jesus himself set forth. This book must be incorruptible in order to bring forth incorruptible fruit. 
It has to be, people. It has to be incorrupt. And I believe it is. Psalm 2230. A seed shall serve him, and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Now, stop right here. I probably uh, won't be able to find it because I'm just, you know, it's just clicking in my head here. But we know in Matthew 24, when he's talking about, you know, the last days and what's going to happen, he said, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Now, a lot of people, I've done this before, a lot of people have tried to look in the Bible to find a time for that. And I am not aware, I've looked, I've looked several times, I'm not aware of any verse that stipulates that a generation is such and such years. Some say it's 40, some say it's 70. They said it was 40 because they were basing that upon the establishment of Israel as a state in 1947. And so some people said, well, 1987, the Lord's going to come back because that's 40 years and a generation's 40 years. Well, that didn't happen. So now, now they were saying, well, Israel established 1947, 70 years later, it's 2017, the Lord's going to come back 2017. That didn't happen. So now they're adding an, a year to it. Well, officially, officially, Israel became a state in 1948. So, therefore, 2018 will be 70 years, and that's a generation. And now the Lord's going I didn't believe it in 1987, and it didn't happen. I didn't believe it in 2017, and it didn't happen. And I'm not believing it. It's going to be in 2018. I mean, the Lord can come back whenever he wants to. But these people constantly keep trying to jam this idea of a generation into a certain time frame. And I don't believe that Jesus meant that when he said it. This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. A generation, according to the Bible, is not necessarily a time span so much as it is a seed. So think about that verse now. This generation let me go back and read Psalm 22. A seed shall serve him, and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. The word generation has the word gene in it. Okay? Gene, literally coming from the word Genesis. That's where the word generation comes from. Genesis, the beginning. And how does it begin? It begins with seed, DNA. So when I think of what the Lord said, this generation shall not pass, I tend to believe that he's referring to the seed shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Now, you are welcome to disagree with that all you want to, and I will bless you for it. Don't want to argue about it, but I give you something to think about, okay? Psalm 25, 13, his soul shall dwell at ease and his seed shall inherit the earth. That's literally true because we're going to come back with Jesus and reign for a thousand years and this earth is going to be ours. Love it. Psalm 37, 25, I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. I love it. Psalm 37, 26, he is ever merciful and lendeth and his seed is blessed. Blessed the word blessed is a salvation word. If you are blessed, you are saved. If you are cursed, you are not. Psalm 32, blessed it is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man in whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and whose spirit there's no God. There's four things here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this blessedness is to those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. His seed is saved. Has their sins forgiven? Uh, his seed, his seed never had to beg for bread. Did Israel beg for bread in the wilderness? They got sick of the manna. But God was faithful, and for 40 years, every day when they woke up, except the Sabbath day, there was manna laying on the ground. God fed them from heaven freely for 40 
years. Well, this Bible's right. This is the promises to the good seed. Psalm 89, 36, his seed shall endure forever. See it? His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. Stop right here. Let's take now what we've learned seed is. Seed is, number one, a bundle of DNA. Seed is the word of God. Seed is an offspring or fruit, right? His seed shall endure forever. So you take that and you apply it to everything that we just established. DNA, God's word endures forever. The words of the Lord endure forever, the Bible says. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. We can never expect that the real word of God would ever fall into corruption, but that it would be purified. Then his seed shall endure forever. The seed, the new man that is inside of me will endure forever. It's an everlasting body because it's made from everlasting seed. Jesus Christ is that seed and he endures forever. Isaiah 61, 9. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people. Think about what that means. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. Stop right here. Their seed shall be known among the Gentiles. Seed is the word of God. And God gave this book to us lowly, unworthy, terrible, wicked, hell-deserving, depraved, Gentiles. Mm. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. Think about it. Christ is the seed. God blessed him. We are the seed. God's blessed us. This book is the seed and God blesses it. There's blessings when you read this book and believe it. Isaiah 66, 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Think about what God is saying. God is all these things that we apply. The seed is the word of God. The seed is Jesus Christ. The seed is the offspring, which we are the seed of Abraham. We're the offspring of Abraham by faith. All of these things, we've seen it repeatedly, will endure forever. Think about it. The devil, what does he do? He loves to corrupt, right? So he takes God's seed in the form of the Bible and he corrupts it. He takes God's seed in the form of tomato seeds, cucumber seeds, wheat seeds, barley seeds, corn seeds, banana seeds, mustard seeds. The devil loves to corrupt, hence genetically modified organisms. We are living and have been living in the days of genetically modified food, genetically modified seed. And God said, don't do it. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. And the devil said, well, I'm going to do that. And he loves to add to and loves to take away from. And when we eat these genetically modified foods and Listen, people, we can't, it's in the day, world we live in now, it's almost impossible to not consume GMO food. And no, right now, I don't believe that GMO, eating GMO food corrupts your DNA. It's going to turn you into a monster. Even if something does have the ability to corrupt DNA in your system, your body has a mechanism of repairing that damage. So I don't think right now eating genetically modified Hamburger buns, it's going to turn me into a beast. I don't think that now, but I think we're heading in that direction. No doubt in my mind. Okay. But in all of these things, here is the incorruptible seed and God preserves it forever. And the devil loves to take that and he corrupts it in the form of the Bible, in the form of the words that are coming out of the pulpits, in the form of the churches, in the form of genetically modified foods, and now we're getting into genetically modified humans. Romans 9, 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. You see it? 
A generation <clears throat> is a seed, and the seed are the children of the promise. They are counted for the seed, not the children of the flesh, not my birth parents and this birth body is not redeemable. It's not savable. It's going to lie on the ground and corrupt and the earth can have it when I'm done with it. Galatians 3.29, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Think about it. This is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. And because we are sons of God, then we are heirs according to the promises that are in this book. So why would anybody, if this is the will that guarantees us as children that we're going to receive the inheritance, why would somebody want to change the wording of the will and the testament? Because somebody else named Lucifer, Satan, Beelzebub, Belial, wants the inheritance for himself. He doesn't want us getting it. So his thinking is, if I can change the words, I change the covenant. Now it belongs to me. Now, that person in the fiery furnace is not the son of God. A son of the gods. Galatians 3.29, And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. 2 Timothy 2.8, Remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. This is all the good seed. Hebrews 2.16, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And why did Jesus do that? so that you and I could be joint heirs with Jesus. Because Abraham's, I love this. Let's go to, since we brought up the issue of Abraham, let's go to Genesis 12. Because that's the first, the number 12, I think, is the number for God's promise. Genesis 12. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and to a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God made this promise to Abram even before he became Abraham. Adding that fifth letter, the letter He. God made this promise to Abram before he ever did anything right, before he took his only son and offered him on Mount Moriah. God made this covenant without Abram's works. But Abram believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And so Christ, think about it. Christ did not take on the form when he comes to the earth, when he manifests himself. He's not coming in the form of an angel. He's manifesting himself out of the seed of Abraham. Why? Because the seed, the offspring of Abraham, God made a promise that he was going to bless the children or the seed, the child, the offspring of Abraham. Typified in Isaac, typified in Jacob, typified in the 12 tribes but specified specifically in Jesus Christ. He became the seed, singular, not seeds, plural. The Bible spells that out too. But seed, singular, one. One child of promise. Out of Abraham, all the families of the earth can be blessed because the seed was Jesus Christ. Oh, man, I love this. I love taking these sayings and getting an understanding then of Bible doctrine. And the more, doc see churches nowadays, oh, we're not here about doctrine. Doctrine's bad. Doctrine's, doctrine separates us. Listen, there's blessing in doctrine. There's, when you understand these intricacies, these delicacies, these minutia things in the Bible. When you understand those, 
It's like God planting a seed in your mind and all of a sudden fruit shows up and manifests and all of a sudden now you know things you never, you never understood before. That's what God's Word does in our minds, people. That's why I always tell you, think Bible, think Bible, okay? Mm, 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 mm. First John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, here's what I want you to understand, I, and I try to teach this to people. There's always some nut out there on Facebook or YouTube telling you, see right here, says if you're saved, you don't sin. You never sin. I never sin. They're lying through their teeth. They're deceiving you. They may have deceived themselves. They may honestly think that they never sin, but they do. They're, in their statement to you, they're bearing false witness against their neighbor. What they'll do is they'll elevate themselves and they say, I'm saved and I never sin. Well, if you sin, obviously you're not saved like I am. See, it's all about magnifying themselves, exalting themselves like Satan does. Second Corinthians 11, Satan himself transformed into angel of light. That's because his ministers exalt, the puff themselves up. And they lower you by saying, well, if you sin, obviously you're not saved. Now here's, if you read 1 John, read the whole thing, all five chapters, including 1 John 5, 7, read the whole thing. And what you'll understand is, like in Romans 7, there's two of me. There's the flesh me, wherein abideth dwelleth no good thing. And the inner man, the flesh me, was conceived by Milton, Don, and... Judy, I won't tell you her real name, Hoggard, okay? That's where I came from, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. What a mess, okay? That me is going to lie in the grave and corrupt and burn up with the fire and the end of the world and do it. I'm, I'm fine with that. That me sins. But the new me the new man that's in me, think of Sarah, the old body bearing the new man in her. She's 90 years old. Nine, nine's the number for fruit bearing, right? Pff, there it is. Do you know the phrase Holy Ghost is mentioned 90 times exactly in the King James Bible? Think Sarah, okay? The old man, the old body, holding and containing the new man, the inner man, which is renewed every day. That inner man, because the seed of it came from God, the inner man, the inner Mike, does not sin. It cannot sin. It doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. Isn't that sweet? But this outer man, sins. I know it. I wouldn't, I couldn't lie to you. This wretched body of mine sins, but that which was conceived of God doesn't. What sweet, isn't it? Now, let's look very quickly at the heart. I got to show you this, okay? Go back to uh, Matthew 13 where he said in verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. See, it tells you right there who the seed, who the tares are, okay? There, there's false doctrines everywhere, and one of them is that the tares, racist, love this parable because they twist it to make it say all the white people, the Caucasians, we're the real Israel and we're the only one salvation's offered to all the blacks, Hispanics, the Jews, the fake Jews, and every, the Chinese, everybody else, they're all the children of the devil. They're the, they're the seed, they're the seed of Cain where Satan 
had sex with Eve and made Cain and all the black people, they're, they're, uh, see, that's what they say. Bunch of filthy liars. You make me sick. Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. In fact, in Revelation 7, it specifically says that people out of every nation and tongue are around the throne of God. You filthy animals. It specifies that the tares are them that offend and which do iniquity. Period. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Here's this picture of wheat and tares. Which is which? If you've seen my presentations on this, you probably would remember that the left side is the wheat and the right side is the tares. Let's look at the harvest. If we go back to this picture of both of the green stalks, you can see why you can't hardly tell the difference. And you can see why the master said, wait. Because you go out there pulling up, you might pull up wheat, and that's, I, I won't do that to my children. I won't do that to my wheat. We're going to wait until harvest, because harvest, there's a transformation. Look at what happens. The wheat turns golden like the sun. And that's exactly what Jesus said. The righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And wheat turns into the same color as the sun. I love this. But the tares, take a look at it. They turn black as sin. Jesus knew what he was teaching. At the end of the time, people, there's coming a transformation of every human being on this planet. For those who are the seed of the righteous, they're going to be transformed in the glorious image of Jesus Christ. The seed of the serpent, there's going to be a manifestation and they are going to be, they're going to look like their father, the devil. Okay? The one who rules over the darkness. Philippians 3.17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, that means their appetites, their lust, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 21. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the work and whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because at his appearing, we are instantly going to be transformed from green stalks to gold it. See, Jesus is the Son of Righteousness, capital S-U-N in Malachi. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. What are we going to be changed into? His image. The image of the Son, Jesus Christ. We're going to shine like the stars do. Like the day star does. You don't believe that? Let's read Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, that's our body now, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Stop right here. Think about it. When you go out, it doesn't matter if it's day or night, and you look up, what do you see? the sun, and all the stars. We're going to be changed into that, the image of the heavenly. Terrestrial bodies, now the seed is going to change us into celestial bodies. Second Corinthians 3.18, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This body was made by God, and it has a certain amount of glory, limited. 
but in the translation, we're going to be changed into a much more. Paul said that in like in 1 Corinthians, I think, when he was talking about Moses. When Moses came down with the law, and that law was to be done away with, his face was shining so bright they couldn't even look at it. There was glory in the Old Testament. But he said, there's more glory now in the New Testament. Like the stars at night, and they look glorious, but when the sun rises, you can't even see the stars. And the stars don't shut off and turn invisible. They're still there. It's just that we can't see it because of the glory of the sun is shining brighter than the glory of the stars. Man, I love this. Second Corinthians, uh, Colossians 3.10, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. And who are the sons of God? In the Old Testament, it was the stars of heaven. Romans 8, 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Philippians 2, 15, here it is, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Look at that. We are going to be transformed into that. But he said, we shine his lights in the world in the midst of a crooked and perverse. What's crooked? The serpent. The children of Satan are a crooked and perverse. Na the word nation always means like ethnicity, a race, a seed. They are crooked, and yet we shine as lights in the world. 1 John 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And he's the light of the world. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That is the harvest. And just as... You have these green stalks of wheat and tares, and you can just barely tell the difference. You look out into a field, and all you see is green. You look out into the world, and all you see is people. Some of them are saved. Most of them are not. How can we tell? God says, we're going to wait until the manifestation of what they really are comes to fruition, the harvest the harvest is always a transformation. So I laid out the case that we, like the wheat stalks, the good seed, are going to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We're going to look like we're his body. Of course we're going to look like him. Whatever that is, I don't think we can even perceive it right now. I have not seen, ear hath not heard, nor entered the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for us, okay? But we are going to be transformed and it's going to be known then that we are the sons of God. Likewise, it is going to be known who isn't the sons of God, who are the tares, who are the children of Belial, the wicked seed, the seed of the serpent. Remember, the tares also are transformed at harvest. And I submit to you that every man, woman, and child on this earth 
at the time of the harvest by some, I think Daniel 2, 43 comes in right here because we know the fourth kingdom, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. We know that they are going to mingle themselves with what? The seed of men, literally man's DNA. And when they do that, man is going to be transformed. It's going to be known that they are the children of Belial. Okay? At harvest time, there's a, there's a transformation of man coming. He is going to be born again, but of corruptible seed, not incorruptible. That's what we're going to look at next week. All right? Wow. Wow. Just to think the harvest, the manifestation of what God's going to do in us because of the pure, undefiled seed of the Word of God. Let's be about our Father's business. All right? Let's think Bible in every case. God bless you. I love you. You're the reason why I sit here and do what I do because I love you. And I love to see the manifestation of the fruit that God brings forth in your life because of this incorruptible word. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.